My name is Mike Moy. I was a former member of a Chinatown gang. I later became an NYPD cop. And this is how crime works. You had so many guns that's hidden all over the place, secret tunnels, and you have snipers up in the safe houses. A crazy person wouldn't even dare to go to Chinatown because even a crazy person, they feel pain, they fear death. So as far as being in Chinatown gang, you're either going to wind up in jail or it's going to be some outcome that's not going to be good. So I was only 16 when I joined the gang, and it was one of the notorious Chinatown gangs during that time. There were a lot of rivals. In the 1970s, the Ghost Shadows and the Flying Dragons, those were the two main gangs. Eventually, you had the White Tigers, the Dongwon Gang, the Fukcheng, the Green Dragons, and the BTK. The violence between the gangs, I wouldn't say it's because of territory. I would say it's because of uh, respect. Any form of disrespect warrants a killing, a shooting. Remember, these kids are young, 13, 15, 16 year old kids. All they want is for people to show them a little respect. Maybe it's because they insecure about themselves or they have a low self-esteem. It's all about respect. And a lot of people died because of disrespect. When we were in the gang, most of us at one time or another had some sort of interaction with the Italian mafia. Even I, myself, in my early 20s were dealing with guys in their 40s and 50s. But these Italian, young Italian teenage kids, they're the ones who were a problem to us. And there were some shootings where some of uh, our guys, we killed some of them. They walk around with their bats and canes and, and want to be tough. And they didn't know who they were messing with because we were never afraid. You know, we were like, we felt we were invincible. During my teen years, we would do extortion, street robberies, petty stuff, petty crime. But then as I got older, got into my 20s, started selling marijuana, dealing with counterfeit money, credit card fraud, stolen credit cards from a source that we had in the post office. I opened gambling houses. A gambling house that we hung out in on Canal Street, right next to the Rosemary Theater in the basement. We would have poker machines from the Italians. They would put the poker machines in there. Sometimes we would have poker tables, pie gal tables, where we collect the percentage. So that was one of the uh, most profitable business I had. And also um, bootleg videotapes. Back in those days, the VCR tapes, those Shaw Brother Kung Fu movies, they made me a lot of money too. All we had to do was get a bunch of VCRs and copy those tapes. So we're talking about the, probably around that time, probably the 80s and, and 90s. After the Italians lost the heroin business in the Pizza Connection trial, yeah, there was a vacuum and the Chinese took over. The Chinese were able to import high quality heroin into uh, Chinatown. They dominated that business for a short while. Just imagine how much money was circulating in Chinatown during those days in just a few block radius. I mean, you had cab drivers, waiters, waitresses, benefiting from all that money, even factory workers, because the gangsters would spend that money into Chinatown. Yeah, they extorted from the stores, but they weren't out there to put the stores out of business. How the media portray us. All the business in Chinatown was flourishing during that time. Look at Chinatown back then. It never sleep. It's open like 24 hours. You get the gang members go into a restaurant during the Chinese New Year's, during whatever holidays, and the owner's gonna give them a little red envelope. It's just a little piece of what they're giving, less than what they probably pay for the garbage disposal, right? To the Italians, you know, we did protect the neighborhood. And I even have personal experiences protecting the businesses, you know, doing what I needed to do back in those days to uh, protect the business owners from getting bullied by people who didn't even know better. Some of those people will remember me for the rest of their life. The person that you least expect to be a gang member, and that's the person that's carrying the gun. So when we travel in a group, 
For example, we go into a pool hall and we're shooting a pool. There'll be a kid in the corner of the pool hall watching over us, and that's the kid that has the gun. There could be a targeted hit where, okay, you're going to go get this person and kill this person, yes. But a lot of times, uh, when they're in the streets, you can't control what they do. It's very easy to get a gun back in those days. I know uh, in the 70s they had um, a source with the Italians getting guns from the Italians in the 80s and 90s. It wasn't that difficult to go out of state and buy a gun. Just show your ID and you just, in the flea market, and you just buy a bunch of antique guns. Safe house are located all over. We had safe houses in Brooklyn by Williamsburg, one by Midwood, Queens by Woodhaven. So we had several places where we hold our meetings. At any given time, there could be as much as uh, 10, 15 people in that apartment uh, sleeping there, living there. We kept it very low key, a side entrance, so it doesn't appear to be a lot of people going in and out. So the runners will go out there and buy whatever is necessary, whether it's food or, or drinks, uh, whatever they need. Generally, the police wouldn't even care about these things. What they care about are guns. But luckily, uh, we hid our guns in a way where the police couldn't find it. One of the ways what we did was we were on the second floor. So we were tying a string and lowered it down to the first floor. And so all you see was a string you know, on the floor. But who would expect when you pull up that string, there's a gun there. There's so many secret tunnels and places for them to hide guns. As far as the tunnels, you had them on uh, Ma Street, Bayard Street, Canal Street, Pell Street, Doyle Street, like these places. Those tunnels was used as a form of escape. After you do a shooting, you just run into the tunnel and just come out from the other side of the street. That's why there's so many cold cases in Chinatown. I was 16 years old when I joined the gang. You know, I saw it as a way to protect me from the bullies. During my years in school, I was like the only Asian kid. So I was a victim of bullying. How did I become a member of the gang? Initially, I started hanging out with them. And when they started to trust me, they know I was able to do things for them. That's when I um, got accepted and they would give you a nickname, such as like Big Head, and say, hey, you have a big head, so we're gonna call you Big Head. And his Onion Head nickname came from his hairstyle. You know, the newspaper and the journals claimed that Onion Head's nickname came from if you uh, betray him, he'll give you tears. That's why they call him Onion Head, but that is not true. He looked like an Onion Head with his hair cut back in those days. They tried to give me a nickname. I put a stop to it. You know, I'm that type of person. Uh, I like to stay under the radar, keep a low profile, and I was firm about it, and they respected that. But what they call me behind my back, that's another story. <laughs> and we did an initiation ritual together with two other members. We kneeled down and we lit up the incense. Uh, we poured wine in front of the general Guan and to give him an offering. In the wine was our blood. We picked our fingers. After the initiation, uh, we felt like a certain bond, like a brotherhood. What the Italians would call probably associate, we would call um, Leng Zai, what the Italians would call a street soldier. We would call them uh, Ma Zai, like a captain, a Dai Ma, an uh, underboss, that would be uh, Dai Lo which is Big Brother, the leader, Dai Lo Dai, and that would be the guy at the top. So how does one become a Dai Lo? Start out as a uh, soldier, and if you have the qualities of a Dai Lo, such as the gift of gab, you have the charisma, then you have these kids following you. You spend money on them, and once you have a crew, you become a Dai Lo. The Dai Lo would give the money to the Dai Ma, that goes to pay for everything, as far as entertainment, food, expenses, the safe house, paying the rent. The money trickles down to us. Unlike the Italians, where the money trickles up, they 
have to pay for our loyalty. What we do in the streets, we basically enhance their reputation. A lot of people have the misconception that tongs, triads, and gangs are the same thing. It's not. The tongs were former gang members in Chinatown who later tried to become a legitimate enterprise association trying to help the new immigrants coming into this country. But you have a handful of bad apples that associate themselves with the gangs and they use the gangs to do the dirty work. The Flying Dragons was under the Hip Sing Tong Association. The Ghost Shadows was under the On Leung Association. And the Tong On Gang was under the Tong On Association. The Flying Dragons had control of Pell Street, Doyle Street, and later on, they moved on to Canal Street and Grand Street. The Ghost Shadows had control of Mott Street, Bayard Street. The White Tigers went to Queens, Elmhurst. Later on, the Dong Wan Gang was created, and they took control of East Broadway. Do the Chinatown gangs still exist today? Yes, they do, but they operate differently. A lot different than what I grew up with. There isn't a uh, Dai Lo, so to speak. There isn't a... Uh, a big leader, like how we had, they keep it totally underground. Back in those days, we dealt with a lot of federal crimes, crimes that want the attention of the FBI. The NYPD didn't have the resources to take on the Asian gangs. They didn't even have the translators available to translate. They were just uh, there to help the FBI, but it was the FBI that cracked these cases. It was around 1993, the FBI started rounding up a lot of people. And that's when it started falling apart. The people at the top was getting locked up. So the people at the bottom didn't know what to do. Most of the gang members were arrested by the feds or they were killed or in prison. That's when I made the transition. And in order to make that transition to go into the NYPD, it had to be like a light switch. It was like an on and off switch. It was either all or nothing. You know, I grew up watching Beretta, Kojak. What happened to Stephen McDonald, if you follow his story, he forgave the kid who shot him. And when Stephen McDonald mentioned that this kid was a part of his environment, did a lot of self-reflection, and I see that how I grew up, you know, it made me who I am, and I, maybe I need to change. So I joined the NYPD in 1995, but the gang was always there for me up until that day. When I took the oath, I left everything behind. I was assigned to work in Chinatown, so I didn't expect to be working in Chinatown, my old stomping grounds as a gang member, and that was um, a little bit nerve-wracking because what would happen if I bumped into my rivals or my fellow gang mates and it did happen. I bumped into my rivals in uniform. I bumped into my former gang mates in uniform. Even when I was uh, assigned to the detective squad and I got promoted many years later, some of these uh, guys came out from prison and I was assigned to arrest them. Some of them couldn't make a living, so they started doing home invasions and robberies, robbing uh, stores and taxi cabs and whatnot. Uh, they started in getting involved with different type of rackets now. Uh, they didn't get involved with the heroin trade anymore because the feds were watching that. So they got involved with other things like the transportation business, the dollar vans, the bus going out of state. They still did their gambling houses and the prostitution houses were run differently as opposed to back in those days where you would go into a prostitution house and you would see 10, 15, even 20 girls. So what they did was they uh, broke it up into like uh, an apartment, you know, and they would only have like maybe one or two girls. The gangs were operating a lot differently. Nobody wanted to call themselves a Dai Lo anymore. I love the NYPD. NYPD gave me everything I have, you know, for all those years. It's just that I had a bad experience while working with some bullies in the NYPD. That left a bad taste in my mouth. So it was time for me to leave. 
I left July of 2021. After over 26 years, I started this channel called Chinatown Gang Stories to get these stories from former gang members who lived a life because there's a lot of misinformation out there. A lot of the information came from non-Asians, uh, movies, authors, and documentaries. My channel will give you an accurate description of what really happened in Chinatown back in those days. What the, I learned from being in a gang, just don't do it. Between social media, like the technology, cell phones, and plate readers, DNA, facial recognition, big brothers watching everything you do. So there's no place in today's society for gangs anymore.